Good evening and welcome to Empower You. I'm Betty Overstreet, the Executive Director. Um, are, do we have anybody tonight that's never been here before? Everybody's been here at least once, okay. I won't go through all those things I usually say then. Um, I do want to say though that uh, we will be, I didn't ask our speaker, are you going to take questions during your presentation or at the end of it? During? Okay. So. If you have a question during the presentation, please raise your hand. One of us will bring the microphone to you. Um, that's important so that everyone here can hear you, but especially the people online, they can't hear if it's not into a microphone. Also, um, we are a nonprofit organization. We run strictly on donations. So towards the end of our class, we do pass around our red buckets. Any donation that you would feel you'd like to give, we appreciate any amount. Uh, it all helps to keep us going forward with our programs. I want to talk a little bit about the classes we have coming up. We're more than halfway through with our classes. Next Tuesday, we have the story about Reagan Tokes. This is a young girl who was an Ohio State University student um, who was kidnapped, raped, and murdered. And this happened by a convicted felon who was wearing an ankle bracelet. Um, I think all of us think when somebody has an ankle bracelet on, they're being monitored and it makes us feel a little bit safer, but evidently that wasn't the case. Her parents, her mother learned about what wasn't happening in that system. So she lives in Florida and she's coming up here to do this class for us to talk about the things um, that aren't working in the judicial system to make us um, more aware. Also coming with her is Rob Fletcher. He's going to be giving tips on how to protect yourself. So if you have, uh, if you know any students, college students or high school students that could benefit from learning these kinds of things, actually I think it doesn't matter whether you're a student. Um, I think we female are a little bit more at risk than you guys of something happening to us. So we'll all benefit from that. Then on Thursday, we have a class called About the Debt, and our own Dan Reganall is the teacher that night. I call him a teacher because he's a really good one. He's a speaker. But um, that's going to be a really interesting class. Dan spends a lot of time working on the classes he presents, so he really knows his topic. And he's going to be coming up in a few minutes, and I'm sure he can tell you a little bit more about what he's going to be talking about. And then we have three more classes throughout the session. And the following week, we have over the Rhine, we have a gentleman that's going to be here uh, talking about the history of over the Rhine. So if you like that kind of history, I think you'll find it very interesting. And then we have the assassin, assassination of JFK. If you've ever been to any of our classes, the JT Townsend, he writes, he's a local crime reporter or writer writes different books about local crimes. And he, um, he hasn't really written a book about this to my knowledge, but he's gonna be talking about the assassination of JFK. And he guarantees me that he has solved this. So any questions that you have, he's got the answer for it. So you won't wanna miss that. And then we're gonna end in December doing something we've never done before. Uh, usually we end before Thanksgiving and we're done until February or March. But in December, we're going to have a gal in here. She's going to be singing Rosemary Clooney and Doris Day songs. It's called Christmas Memories. It's just going to be a fun night. So um, check your calendars, get, that, get all those on there, and come to our classes. Get your tickets out, because now we're ready for our door prize giveaway. Good evening, everyone. So, um, so Betty's been kind of tough with me. Um, she's been saying, you know, why are you giving away all these political gifts and all these heavy duty books and stuff? She said, you need to bring out your softer side a little bit. So tonight we've got a little softer uh, uh, side of us with Thanksgiving approaching. We've got 104 Thanksgiving knock knock jokes for you. Um, let me just let me just preview some of the uh, highlights. Not, uh, now this is random here. Knock knock. Who's there? Honey bee. Honey bee who? Honey bee a deer and get me a soda. Okay, that's good, right? Um, knock, knock, who's there? Jamaica. Jamaica who? 
Jamaica pie for J J Jamaica pie for me too. So uh, and a little a nice little thankful cheese board for your uh, enjoyment. So let's get our popcorn maker from last night to draw us a number. Mel, let's give Mel and Judah a hand. They do a lot for Empower You. Would you thank them for me? Um, three two nine for the knock knock. Jo All right. You are a multiple, multiple winner, right? Karen. Karen, let's get Karen uh, so you'll have to circle the, not, the best knock-knock jokes for us. And uh, here, here's your cheese board. Um, and congratulations. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Um, so last night we had our, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, all the people online tonight. We have several people online and it's good, good to have you join us. Thank you. And um, last night we had a great night here. We had six speakers and um, just some different interesting thoughts about things. And the winner was Jack Sinking who talked about um, the myth of gun violence. And Jack really stepped it up. It was really fun to watch him. Uh, a couple other things that we're working on. We've got this little contest you can participate if you're interested in. It involves this penny on the wall over to the side. And uh, it's this one right over here. Um, it's a little crooked. Uh, you think that I should be able to hang pictures here being in the picture frame business. Um, but so the contest, you can pick one of these little forms up to tell me why this is here. Uh, it might have to do with an upcoming class. Let me just tell you, give you a few ideas what people have said. Ben Franklin said, a penny saved is a penny earned. It could be that, maybe. A um, couple other thoughts, what people said were, let's see here, I haven't really read these. A hundred pennies, a hundred years, 19th Amendment, maybe. Um, Lincoln is the president that established freedom for all the slaves in the southern states. He's also the president stamped on the lowest coin. His symbol faces the opposite way due to him going against his cabinet. Well, maybe. Um, one more. Let's see here. Double stamped makes it the most sought after penny. Okay. So if you have an idea what that penny might stand for, just pick one of these up at the back and fill it out. And uh, this will go through the end of next week. So two more classes. So a couple thoughts about a couple of our classes. Betty talked about Tuesday. I talked to the, one, the young girl's mom who, whose daughter was killed. And uh, she just asked me to make sure to tell you all that if you have any kids or grandkids, you can bring that night, that this gentleman that she's bringing with you is really gonna give you some self-defense tips to, to help you if you ever get into a case where somebody taps you on the back and, and, and there's not good with it. Um, he's really got some good, good things that, um, that he wants to share with us. And what she wants to share with us is that government is really endangering us by letting all these criminals out with GPS monitors that are not, aren't being watched by anybody. So she's coming up from Florida Tuesday. I hope you'll all come. It's going to be a great session. And then Thursday night next week, um, I've got a trillion reasons why you should come to uh, my session that I'm going to be putting on about the deficit and the debt. And um, gosh, I just want to tell you the solutions pretty easy. It really is. Uh, I'll have a few different um, ideas for you. And I'll be talking about what I call minefields that are kind of uh, in front of us for the next couple years. And that's kind of a vision of what's going on um, on the wall that we'll be talking about next week. So you see the ring on the outside, that's all the money that's being spent. And it's so much more than the inside green ring, which is how much money we're bringing in. 
it's totally overshadowing, totally crowding out the amount of money that we're bringing in. If you just look at that visual, it's staggering. Uh, it's, really, it's really staggering to imagine that a group of people like us, who is smart enough to tell their cities, their counties, their states, that they can't spend a dime more than they bring in, how could the same people ever let their federal government not be held to that standard? Um, it's still shocking to me. I still have trouble understanding how we could be so, um, so off track. I hope you'll come next Thursday night. I think it'll be interesting. Coming next Thursday night, joining me next Thursday night will be a friend of Empower You, the first 15 minutes, Jack Atherton, who is the former uh, anchor at Fox uh, 19 and also Channel 5 WLWT. Jack has talked to us about media uh, before he's talked to Empower You about media. He'll be coming next Thursday night to tell you about what he's been doing and about a, a fun new book he's written. And Jack is a great guy. He'll be here next Thursday. Um, I, our friend Mr. Janice isn't here tonight with his, his petition referendum for the Hamilton County sales tax that's only got a few days left. He left me one of these. I would be glad to allow you to sign it if you're interested at the end. You just have to catch me kind of quickly on the way out. If, you're, if you haven't signed it, if you're passionate about it, um, I, I've done this. So I'd be glad to take your signature. And um, I think that's all I wanted to chat with you about tonight. And um, so I'm pleased to have a chance to introduce our guest speaker, Ken Williamson. He's a native Cincinnati and a graduate of Norwood High School and Ohio University where he studied photography. He was a U.S. Army photographer and journalist in Vietnam in 1969 and owned his own film and video production company for 28 years in Cincinnati. His service in Vietnam as a photographer, including the 815th Engineers in Ploika and the 26th Public Information Detachment, USAECAV. While with the 26th, Ken traveled throughout South Vietnam documenting engineer operations. His photo photography appeared in engineering publications. We're really glad tonight to welcome our speaker, Ken Williamson. Thank you, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, see so many veterans uh, in the group. Can I just have the veterans here just raise their hands and just so we can see? Yeah, it's, it's a nice group of veterans. I appreciate you coming out tonight. And uh, I'm going to be talking about my experiences in Vietnam, but I'm also going to be talking about my two return trips to Vietnam. So you'll get an idea of what it looks like today. So what I'd like to do is just tell you a little bit first about the book saying goodbye to Vietnam. It includes photographs that I took in Vietnam, a few for the engineers, but mostly I carried a second camera and I shot photographs for myself. And I was so interested in, in the people of Vietnam and the country. So you're not gonna see a lot of the war in this book and you're not gonna see a lot of the war here tonight, but what you are gonna see is some of the people that I met, some of the places where I went, and I'll be talking about some of the guys who went back with me to Vietnam on the second trip. Uh, all that's included in the book, along with excerpts from letters between my wife and myself. Uh, we were expecting our first child when I left for Vietnam. So that added a little bit of uh, extra angst to the trip, if you will. Uh, and there are also some letters in there from college professors and English teachers, things like that. I already had my degree in photography. I worked for the Defense Intelligence Agency for a year. Uh, before going uh, into the military. So I was a little older when I went. Many of you are familiar with the country of Vietnam. And if you remember, it was, it was divided into two parts, North Vietnam and South Vietnam. And for those of you who were in the military or who even were in Vietnam, I know there are some of you here who were, I don't have to go into a, to a definition about the DMZ. So, uh, this area here is, 
is north of Pleiku, and this is where I first went. And I wasn't sure what was going to happen when I went to Vietnam. For example, when I was in the United States, I was with a very elite photography unit. I traveled around, lived in hotels, um, wore civilian clothes, was never in uniform uh, very often after basic training. Uh, this unit recorded almost everything that happened stateside in the military. There were four units and they were called DASPO, Department of the Army Special Photo Office. And there were four units. One was in Panama, uh, one was in the United States, one was in Europe, and one was in Southeast Asia, and of course stationed in Vietnam. And they shot almost all the film for the Department of Defense, film and photography. Along with them, there was the 221st signal, and they shot a lot of, a lot of things. So the, the, the combat photography you generally see on the news or in documentaries was mostly filmed by those two units plus the civilian press that was there. Um, so I ended up in Play Coup uh, not knowing you know, what my assignment was going to be until I got, until I got to Vietnam. And I was assigned to an engineer unit. I thought, what does an engineer unit need with a photographer? <laughs> well, I soon found out that they were building roads north and south and east and west. And Pleiku is located in the central highlands. It's, it's sort of uh, central to the country and a little bit um, west. And it sat pretty much on where the, what was called the Ho Chi Minh Trail came through. Uh, and that wasn't really a trail, it was sort of an area where they, they would bring supplies in, North Vietnamese would bring supplies in um, through Laos. But I was stationed at, up here at this little hillside, up in the right-hand corner. And you can see it says Engineer Hill at the top. There are a lot of other camps around that area. There's Artillery Hill up here. And Artillery Hill had all the big guns on it. So whenever our guys needed uh, to have some kind of cover out in the jungle somewhere, it could be downrange five miles, 10 miles. I don't know how far they reached. But they could keep us awake all night long, uh, just firing these things up over our head. It was very, very loud. Um, so that was where I was at first. And the, the city of Pleiku is actually down, a, oh, sorry, actually down a little lower than this. Uh, down in the lower left-hand corner. So this was my home for about four months, maybe three, three and a half, four months. And this is what Engineer Hill looked like if you were at the top of it, looking south, southwest. And because we were engineers, we could build things like places to live. Uh, this was a tent city uh, before I arrived. But uh, we, we built these uh, buildings. And around these buildings, you see all the sandbags, which protected us from shrapnel at uh, night if there's a rocket attack, um, unless it came through the roof. Um, and this is the view looking out uh, south at the perimeter. And we, our perimeter went all the way around the camp. And we had, um, we had these um, bunkers out here. So all of us had to pull guard duty about five nights a week, plus do our regular job. So if we were out, out on the perimeter of guard duty, we could sleep two hours. We we're supposed to sleep four hours. Uh, nobody really slept a lot, but we do our regular job during the day too. So we only got maybe two or three hours of sleep a night uh, the whole entire time. Um, so this, this is where my dark room was. It was in this little concrete bunker. And I didn't find out until probably about four or five months ago what that little concrete room really was. I ran into a guy that was there before I got there. And he told me that the French used it as an ice house to store ice. So that's why the, the walls were a foot and a half thick. And uh, there was no air conditioning and no windows. But um, we built this very crude dark room, and as you can see, there's a tank on the top of there. That's actually a bomb crate, and we converted that into a water tank. So I was able to have water to process my film, but it came from the lake. 
So if you notice that that little uh, pipe is, is tilting up, this pipe that was right over here is, is tilting up a little bit and it's not at the bottom of the tank. So what, what this would do is allow the dirt to settle on the bottom of the tank. And then by gravity, we could, we could run the water through. Um, so this was the inside of the dark room, very crude, uh, not, a, not a great setup. Uh, thankfully, I had a degree in photography, which included a lot of chemistry. And so most of the photographs you're gonna to see tonight that are black and white were processed in this dark room in Lake Water. And all of my pictures in the book were scanned at high resolution from the original negatives. Uh, because I had this knowledge, I didn't have to worry about my negatives fading, and I still have prints today that are absolutely pristine, just like they were when I printed them. Uh, this is a shower that the engineers built, and uh, it was very unique in that we could have hot water to take a shower with, uh, as long as no one stood in there too long. So. So these are just some of the buildings. Uh, you'll see these walkways a lot in, in a lot of pictures. The, this is because we had the monsoon rains. And for those of you who served there, you know we got up to 22 inches of rain a day sometimes. So when that happened, uh, I'll just flash through here really quick. Uh, when that happened, I'll come back to this. Well, I better go back. This slide got out of order, sorry. Um, when that happened, we were in mud up to our knees sometimes, and a lot of vehicles didn't, didn't move too well. So this was Engineer Hill. When we were there, the military always lost our laundry. For you guys who were there, you'll know. We very seldom got our laundry uh, back. But um, so we, we all put, to, put our money together and we, we hired some locals to come on pace and do our laundry. And the way they did it was it, again, using lake water. They'd pull a tanker up and then they'd wash our laundry in these little pans. We had to provide the soap, which we got from the PX. And They would um, lay the clothes out on, on the ground to dry after, we, uh, after they washed them. So I don't know how clean they really were. Uh, my wife sent a package of zinnia seeds to me and I wasn't sure they were gonna grow because even, even if, if we had a lot of rain, um, we didn't have one blade of grass growing on our hill uh, because of Agent Orange. I know I'll be talking about Agent Orange a little bit as we, as we go along here. Uh, so I didn't have a whole lot of hope for these zinnias, but I think it was mostly because of the rain and because this area was very sheltered. Uh, but you can see the zinnias really did grow. Uh, it was quite a garden and it was pretty much the talk of everybody who came, came along and visited Engineer Hill. They all wanted to visit the zinnia garden. Uh, it was probably the only highlight <laughs> we had. So on, on Sundays, a group of us would visit the orphanage, which was up in the hills. And uh, how many of you veterans ever had that experience when you were, you were there? Um, well, it, it, was a, it was both a, a, a good experience and, and uh, a very sad one, as you might imagine. But the scenery along the way was, was like this. Um, the orphanage was up, up in the mountains area. It took us probably about 30, 45 minutes to drive up there. No roads, we just had to take little back paths and driving a Jeep. So this was the orphanage and the church. It was run by the uh, French Catholic Church. And they actually started it when, when the French were there in the, in the 50s. And uh, a lot of those people stayed after the French left and we, and we came in and took over. So you'll see the, the kids here doing, doing some chores. And I want you to remember uh, these two doors. Uh, we're gonna revisit these 
doors a little later uh, in return trips. Um, so, so what I found when I went there were, were all these kids, and we went there to help the nuns paint and build things. Uh, the Viet Cong would come in at night and steal anything that we brought to them. So, you know, it was one of these things where we were always taking new mattresses. We were always taking generators up there because their generator would either fail or the Viet Cong would steal it during the night. Um, but what I noticed was when I went back week after week, some of the children like this uh, still had the same dirty clothes on they had the week before. And a lot of them still had the dirty faces they had because they didn't have a lot of water to take baths with. They didn't have any money. Uh, most of these children were either orphaned because their parents were killed in the war or because their parents couldn't afford to keep them because they had no, no jobs and no money. Um, so the, the war affected a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of children. This is one of my favorites. Um, I'll be reading a, a poem a little bit later talking about blue lines etched in my memory forever. And uh, this little girl has a lot of little blue lines drawn on her left wrist there. And uh, that was because she got a hold of my pen and I think if the nuns had had a ruler, I'd be uh, still, still uh, uh, bruised from it. But, uh, but you can see the kids were, were very, very uh, uh, sad and, and lonely. The Vietnamese, of course, were very resourceful. Uh, they took everything that we threw away and made something out of it. In some cases, they made homes out of cardboard boxes. In this case, they made a downspout at it out of Canada Dry soda cans. And uh, this helped them recover rainwater so that they could, could use it for, for cooking or bathing or washing or, or for their garden. Um, and of course, like anything else, I mean, they didn't have any gym sets, so they, whatever they used, they, they made their own, own things, you know. They, they uh, uh, were very resourceful in that way. And then, this is Highway 19. This is one of the roads our engineers built uh, east and west across Vietnam. Highway 14 ran north and south, and there was another Highway 1, which I'll talk about later. But this was the most dangerous road because it went through the mountainous region of the Central Highlands going toward An Khe. And we had a lot of ambushes here uh, of our convoys. We lost a lot of men building this road. Uh, usually think of of losing men because they're in a firefight face-to-face -face in combat. But for every person that was doing that particular job in the infantry or in other units, there were 10 or 12 people behind the scenes who were driving trucks and building roads and cooking food and, and so on. But even those people, like the people who built these roads, uh, would come under fire from rocket attacks or ambushes unexpectedly. So while they weren't out there searching for the enemy and, and being really in harm's way 24 hours a day, uh, we could easily get, get killed by just some sniper that's up in the bush. So one of the things the United States did was they decided that the trees were a problem because of the Viet Cong could hide in the trees. And so they killed them all. And that's what you see on the left-hand side of the road. All those trees are dead. And they sprayed Agent Orange there. Within three to four days, the 100-year-old tree could be no more. Um, and of course, they told us it was perfectly safe. Wouldn't hurt humans at all. Um, that's why out of the two... 2,900,000 of us who served in Vietnam, um, there's only a third of us remaining today. And Agent Orange has taken its toll with cancers, 
The guys who sprayed this have long since passed. Um, then there are those of us who are, uh, have about 13 different cancers. Uh, somehow, so far, I have escaped it. Um, but a lot of my friends have not. So what, what I found when I went back to Vietnam and it, reading some, some studies is that the, um, the chemical stays in the ground for about 100 years. So what I found was a lot of young children and adults having cancers because of this. Our government has been working on cleaning it up, but they are, um, uh, they're spending a lot of money uh, at two of the airports just cleaning the dirt where this stuff was stored. Uh, and it was also sprayed in the United States. If you do some studies and research, you'll find the bases that it was, was sprayed on here. So all along this highway, uh, we, we have an oil pipeline running through here. Uh, we had to have protection all along the highway. Uh, this is one LZ Schuler, landing zone Schuler, and, and uh, you could stop there and rest a little bit, have some security if, if uh, you had a problem. Uh, but they, they had some great little signs, you know, uh, pit stop and um, I think it says beer, 25 cents. Uh, this is LZ Action, uh, home of the famous Billy G Action. And he was one of the people who got killed building that particular LZ. And of course it says, uh, next right, food lodging and fire support. So uh, we did have a sense of humor. This is an ambush. I talked about ambushes on the, on the highway. And uh, sometimes I rode in a convoy, sometimes I didn't. It depended on what we were doing and what the mission was. Uh, but on this particular day, we chose, uh, we were doing some mapping and uh, recording where some of the culverts were that we built and the bridges and so on. Because as they were building these things, they didn't record a lot of where, where they were or what, what sizes they were or anything. So, so I was part of that team, the surveyor team, that went out and did reconnaissance. So we were uh, in a hundred vehicle convoy. Now that seems like a lot. Uh, but the front of that convoy got hit over the other side of the mountain. And I think it killed uh, at least six, six of our guys. Um, but all we could do is just kind of sit there because you can't do a U-turn. <laughs> the road's too narrow. Uh, you've got all these trucks around. Uh, so we just sat there while they called in air support and took, took care of the problem. But it, it was a problem a lot on this highway. And of course, you know, graffiti's everywhere. And as our guys built this road, they left their mark, uh, different units and names. And uh, for those of you who were there, you know what this is, it's the monsoon rain. And I've never seen rain this hard, ever. Uh, before Vietnam or since, you can see it in the air <clears throat> against the building there. And uh, it would sometimes rain like this for days. And uh, when it did, it caused a lot of trouble for us getting around. And we had a lot of roads that would wash out. We'd have to go out and repair them. Uh, we had a lot of bridges that would wash away and we'd have to go out and repair those and replace them. Um, so it caused a lot of trouble. And uh, we had, a lot of us ordered rain suits from the states. <laughs> and it did help keep us a little dry. The Army didn't issue them, and they didn't like them. But uh, uh, there you see the one that I, I had sent to me. And then there's downtown Plague too. And this is interesting because you can see an open sewer running through the downtown. And you can see how they sold things just out of carts and the roads are dirt. But I want you to remember this particular photograph when we move forward, just like I asked you to remember the door. 
because we're going to revisit this a couple of times. And the marketplace is just like any other marketplace you might picture in a third world country. Uh, everything's sold on the street. Uh, nothing is really trucked in in trucks or even today, a lot of things are still sold on the street. Uh, this is an interesting shot because uh, the big boy hamburgers. Now, the Vietnamese love to um, uh, steal ideas from the United States and see if they can make a little money with them. So this is a big boy hamburger shop. And I guarantee your Frisch's had nothing to do with it. Um, but if you go a little bit closer, you can, you can see what it says. Uh, first of all, it says the cleanest kitchen in town at the top, which I highly doubt. And then down the side, um, the only one in, in town, stateside taste, and it's spelled wrong, hot hamburgers made in front of you, try one. Now, I don't know of anyone who ever went there. <laughs> it's, I certainly didn't, but uh, I find it funny. And then after I was in Pleiku for about three months, um, a lot of my photographs were circulating around the country. The engineer headquarters was getting them and sending them out in press releases and so on. And uh, my colonel called me in one morning and said, son, aren't you happy here? I said, well, yes, sir, I'm happy here. Of course, you know, nobody was happy when they, when they were. Uh, he said, well, he said, I don't understand because I just got orders from headquarters that you're being transferred. And he said, did you ask for this transfer? I said, no, sir, I did not. So it was a surprise to me, but the general, head of the engineers, was starting a newspaper and a magazine. This was very common in, in, in Vietnam. It was common in World War II, where the units would have some kind of little publication they'd send out. But this was the 60s, and we were a little more sophisticated than we were in World War II. In World War II, I have one that my uncle had, and it was printed on one of those little blue mimeograph machines, you know. <laughs> but, but these were, were full-blown publications, and they were printed in Japan. So they asked me to go down there and be their photographer. And I, I was kind of worried about it. I didn't know if I wanted, to, wanted the job or not. So I called down there and got some advice, and I had another couple of friends of mine who were serving in Vietnam in photography, and I called them. And it wasn't like you call them today, like you just don't pick your cell phone up. I mean, but we could have ways of communicating. Um, so what this job was is it gave me a press pass to go anywhere in the country of South Vietnam, and literally anywhere whether it was off limits or not off limits. And I could fly anything, I could ride on anything. If I, needed a, if I needed a flight somewhere, I'd just go down to the airfield, put a copy of these orders down and say, I wanna go here or I wanna go there. If there's someone on a helicopter, if there were, were five colonels on a helicopter and I was a spec four and there were no seats, guess who had to get off? Not me. <laughs> uh, and of course I didn't go talk to colonels about that but I talked to the crew chief and he, he took care of it. But uh, so I got a press pass and I got to stay in what they called a press camp. And this is where all the news media stayed, Walter Cronkite, all those guys, they all stayed in these places. And they had about 15 of them set up all around the country. Uh, I was on an expense account. So I could go down to finance and draw some money because I had to pay for this. Even though it was military owned, I had to, still had to pay for it. So I could just get reimbursed at the end of, of whatever trip I was on. I'd take my receipts down and I'd get reimbursed. And the best, the best part about this was, this was the only air conditioned building I, I saw in four months. And this was the, um, this is in Fubai, which is up near the DMZ. And this was a press club. And you open up that door and it's like walking into a BW3s. I mean, they had Armed Forces TV network. They had a pool table. Uh, they, they had uh, steak dinners for two bucks, uh, a full bar. I mean, it was just, 
you know, I, I just thought I was not in the, I was not in Vietnam anymore. Um, my first assignment, they wanted, the military wanted to know what the road meant to the people that they had just finished. They had finished Highway 1. Highway 1 runs from Hanoi down through the DMZ. Of course, we couldn't travel that part. But it runs all the way down the coastline of South Vietnam and then in through Saigon and on into Cambodia. And they built that road and maintained it because we needed it for a supply route. But it also brought the cities of the country closer together so they could trade with one another. And they could, they could have buses and they could transport people and, and so on. So I got kind of tired of reading these military maps and finding my way around with a compass so, uh, or asking directions. So when I first started this trip in Fubai, I saw this SO gas station. I thought, I wonder if they give away free maps there. They do in the United States, you know. So I went, I went in there and, and uh, sure enough, they had road maps. So I picked a couple of them up and I was traveling with another guy and uh, we uh, kept track of every place that we went. So this is one of the tools I used in the book to figure out where I was sometimes because after 50 years, you, it's almost impossible to remember all that. Um, so in this particular case, uh, I was in Fubai and I was in Wei, and we decided we were going to hitchhike this road because that's a better way to see it. So you can get, you know, hitchhiking on military vehicles. It, you know, it's not a real big deal, but you don't want to hitchhike on civilian vehicles. Well, we didn't really quite grasp how dangerous that could be. Uh, so we started out. And uh, these are some of the scenes we saw. Of course, there, there's barbed wire everywhere. So, um, but here again, it was a beautiful country. And I documented that beauty with, with my own personal camera. Um, and most of my, my slides, almost all of them, were sent back to Finley, Ohio in a mailer. And those mailers had ID numbers on them. So I'd write the ID, ID number down on, on a notebook uh, and write down the shots that I had and where they were taken and what date they were taken. And I'd put my wife's name on the mailer. So she would get the mailer, she got the slides, she would write on each slide where that was and what it was. So that was another aid when I decided to do this book that I had, had that. And I always wanted to write the book when I was in Vietnam, I said, someday I'm going to do this book. Well, someday never happened until about five years ago <laughs> when, when I really started getting serious about it because I realized I had a whole uh, history lesson here. And I do a lot of talking to uh, school systems, to the kids, especially around Veterans Day, but other times too, and uh, help those teachers teach the class. There's about 15 of us who do that. Uh, out in Claremont County. Um, so I decided that shots like this might be important someday. And of course, you know, the one previous to that shows the barbed wire around and barbed wire was everywhere. Um, this is the Citadel at Way. This is where the uh, Marines had their big battle in, in the Tet of 68. And a lot of this, this is the original city uh, and a lot of this was destroyed uh, because we weren't, we weren't supposed to, to bomb it. We weren't supposed to shoot it. We weren't supposed to explode anything in it. But when the Marines got pinned down there, it was such a serious issue that they said, let's just forget about that. We're going to take care of business. And they did. And so a lot of it got destroyed during that, during that battle. Um, this is a kid I ran across with a popsicle. I don't know where he found a popsicle in Vietnam, but I guess somewhere, some vendor. But uh, this made it on the back, uh, back cover of one of the magazines. And of course, this is the road, and you can see all kinds of vehicles on it. 
um, all kinds of modes of transportation. And, and of course, you know, through the mountainous region uh, on the coast of the South China Sea, south of Da Nang, you'd see a lot of military vehicles getting supplies back and forth. Uh, there was only one train line, one train track, and it ran parallel with this road. And uh, probably it only ran a couple times a month because the VC kept blowing up the track. So that made the road even more, more important. And even here, you can see there are no mature trees. This hillside once upon a time had a lot of valuable lumber on it. This is the uh, port in Da Nang, and there was a press camp right on the water here, which is kind of an interesting place. And uh, this is an aerial shot that I did in Cam around Cameron Bay. Uh, we got down, right before we got to Cameron Bay, uh, we uh, pulled into a special forces camp there and uh, the people who were giving us a ride dropped us off there and we met some guys from special forces and they asked us what we were doing and we told them and they said well you're not going to go any further than this because they just blew the road up yesterday <laughs> so unbeknownst to us because we were, we were on the we were on this road for a while and on this trip uh, the VC had started a huge campaign across the country and they attacked 30 cities that night. Um, so uh, we actually took a helicopter and flew over <laughs> part of the road and then we landed here in Cameron Bay where a buddy of mine ran, ran a um, photo lab because we thought we might as well get, get some of our stuff processed, see what we had. So when we got there that night, uh, he, they were supposed to pick us up around 11 o'clock that night when this C-130 got us in there. And the hospital had been uh, bombed. Uh, satchel charges were thrown in on, the, on tops of the patients. Uh, it was the first time that Cameron Bay had ever been infiltrated by the enemy. And so we spent the night on the cement floor in the, uh, in the terminal. And this is uh, downtown Saigon. Driving in Saigon's a mess, still is. <laughs> it's better now, a little bit. Uh, but we had a, um, a Jeep Scout that we drove, no air conditioning, of course. Um, and every time I go to Saigon to file a story with the news media, we'd have to drive through this mess. It took us two or three hours just to get through town. There'd be four lanes going one way, and then all of a sudden, those four lanes would be down to one, and there'd be four lanes coming this way. And all these vehicles were going in and out. You can see the bicycles, you can see motorcycles, you can see old trucks. And all these vehicles just about were, were left over from when the French were there. So you can imagine the pollution, uh, the blue haze in the, in the air, uh, your throat was sore all the time. But, that's the kind of traffic they had. And so you can, uh, you can see some vintage automobiles here. Many of you probably recognize them. But again, the Vietnamese were very resourceful. Everyone had a job, the kids had a job. Um, you know, this kid sold brooms to try to get a little money for his family. Um, um, this kid is working on selling some bread while visiting the toy store. Um, these guys are reading the comic page. Uh, there's a wannabe captain there on the left who painted captain's bars on his hat. Um, and then when you get closer over to Cambodia, uh, you start seeing, you know, rice paddies again and, and the road gets flatter. And I was very disappointed with the Cambodian border. I thought I'd see something there. It was really, you know, like a bunch of, bunch of our guys standing there with weapons and some guards and whatever, but that's all there was. It's very disappointing. Just a bunch of barb, barbed wire. Um, 
And then there was Vietnamization. I did a story about Vietnamization, and I don't know how many of you remember what that was about. But Nixon decided that um, a way to get out of Vietnam was to start training the South Vietnamese to do all of our jobs. So uh, we had all these training programs that sprung up everywhere. And we were, we were told that during the, this story we were writing on Vietnamization, we were told that if we found anything negative about this program, we weren't to write about it. Well, of course, it, would never, it wouldn't have gotten out of Vietnam anyway because we were writing for army periodicals. Uh, we didn't find anything negative, uh, but what we found was that the Vietnamese were, were fairly slow learners. And they were slow learners because they had never been around mechanization. Here in the United States, you know, our guys grew up on a farm. They could repair a tractor. They could uh, work in their, in their father's plumbing business. They could, you know, repair things, fix things, think, think things through. The Vietnamese didn't, didn't have that kind of exposure. So they were learning from the ground up. So these big rock crushers we had that were crushing the rock and the asphalt plant that we had that was making the asphalt to build the roads, that's a difficult job to learn. If you're not, if you don't have any kind of background in that, it's, it's, it's hard. But the Vietnamese were very conscientious about it. This guy's a welder. Now, you also notice that they all had cigarettes in their mouth too, except for the firefighter here, he didn't. But um, you can see, you know, we had mechanics and we had welders. Um, so what we know in the end was, of course, uh, we, we walked away in 1973. Uh, in my book, I have two letters. One is from Nixon to Ho Chi Minh, and one is from Ho Chi Minh to Nixon. And uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, writes in there that, you know, the United States should leave and so we could have peace with honor. Well, of course, that became Nixon's theme, peace with honor. I don't want to say he stole it from Ho Chi Minh, but Ho Chi Minh died after he wrote that letter in, I think it was July or August of 69. Uh, Ho Chi Minh died of a heart attack in uh, uh, September of that same year. And so that was 1969, and we didn't actually get out of Vietnam until 73 with, with thousands of guys, more guys getting killed. So... Uh, the peace with honor thing all came out of those two letters and out of this Vietnamization kind of program that, uh, that we had. Um, and then there was the Delta region. I uh, went on a couple of missions here. And the Delta, of course, is totally different. It's all wet. It's all underwater. Um, it's all swamp land just about. There's some areas that aren't, but uh, it's very dangerous to travel through here. Uh, but, you know, you meet interesting people, and they all lived on boats there. They didn't have homes, or if they had any homes at all, they were on stilts. Um, and again, the monsoon rain coming up over the South China Sea. So I left Vietnam in January of 1970, and I was anxious to see my daughter. I hadn't I've never, I've never seen her, of course, except in pictures. Um, so I wanted to be home in the worst way. So I did, uh, I did get home. I, I started my career over again, which was difficult because I'd already, when I went into the military, I was already 24, 25 years old. So I wasn't one of the 19-year-olds that got drafted. I had a college degree. I had, I had a um, career started. Um, and now I come home and I have this ready-made family and the army says, here's your 300 bucks and your plane ticket. And uh, by the way, uh, don't wear your uniform anywhere because uh, there are all these picketers and all these people throwing eggs and rocks and whatever. And uh, if, you, if you have medals that say you were in Vietnam, don't wear those either. Uh, and uh, you can have your steak dinner and your baked potato, uh, but you have to be off post within an hour afterward, otherwise you'll be arrested for trespassing. So that was kind of the message that we got. So for many, 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 many years, I really never talked much about Vietnam. Uh, 
because I was a photographer, I got to show my work a little bit to some people. Um, but my dream job was to work in broadcasting and documentary production. And uh, I got that job and I did that for three years. And after three years of, of working in broadcasting, which is a 24 hour job if you're doing documentaries. I mean, it's, you have all kinds of deadlines for air dates and you can't miss a deadline for an air date. I mean, that's just not gonna happen. So I was sleeping in my office some nights. I was missing, missing my kids at, kids at home. So I decided to start my own business in video production and I did that for 28 years until I decided to sell the company one day. And uh, then later on, I went to work for another company as CEO of, broad, uh, of production. So I had this career going. I built my business into an international company. I had clients in, in Asia and Europe and South America and all the way across the United States. And I was working for Fortune 100 and 500 companies at the highest level, at the, at the CEO level. And I think that was, I was successful at that because of my Vietnam experience. It, uh, it made me fearless in some ways. So, uh, but anyway, here we are. And it's 1998 and I'm going back to Vietnam. And what made me decide to go back was I had this idea to do a documentary on the women who served in Vietnam. And a friend of mine who was, who was a nurse uh, was prodding me to do this documentary and I thought it was a really good idea. So the idea I came up with was I would, I would take eight former women who served back to Vietnam and have them meet eight former Viet Cong women who also served. And we'd take a couple psychologists with us and we'd have some PTSD healing and some work and so on and see what happens. Well, it was an impossible project to fund. But before I could even go that far, I had to get permission from the communist government to shoot my documentary there. So that was my reason for going back to Vietnam. So I spent about six months working with some other people, uh, peace trees out in, out in uh, um, Seattle. And they were going back and digging up landmines and building schools to educate kids so they wouldn't step on these mines and blow their legs off and things like that. But they had the contacts that I, I needed to get, get to where I wanted to go. So I partnered with them and I went back and I did, I did meet the government. I did meet the, the, the top guy in, uh, in charge of um, press relations for the government. And I got, I got the, the, the project approved. But I thought that was the reason I was going back to Vietnam. But I also thought about this book. And I knew that having photographs taken from some of the same places would be something that really we should do. So I took off and uh, I got to the hotel that night. My, I hired a guide and a driver for the whole entire trip. So I planned the trip to all the places I wanted to go. I didn't care what, where they wanted to take me. So I hired them, and the first day I was there, my feet hit the ground, and they had me running around as a tourist all over the place, and brought me back to the hotel, said, um, we're going to pick you up tomorrow morning. It's perfectly safe. Just go outside, find a restaurant to go to, and pick one, and you'll be fine. So in the meantime, I picked up my, my film. I had my film processed at one of the little corner places there, and I went back up to my room and I was sorting through the photographs from the day and it's time for dinner. So I walk out and uh, immediately I was surrounded by little kids and beggars and they all had their hands out. And for, for those of you who were ever there, you know what happens when the kids get around you, your watch disappears, your wallet disappears, your shoelaces are gone, uh, your boots if you step out of them. Uh, so everything just disappears. And of course, the thing that could also happen is there could be some five-year-old with her hand behind her back with a grenade. So all these memories started flowing back and I couldn't do it. I turned around, went back in the hotel, went back to my room. I did this four times. I got as far as the corner the second time. <laughs> so I did this four times. And, and a few years before that, I had met some Marines at the wall in Washington, DC. It was my first trip to the wall. And um, I... Um, said to them, 
what are you guys doing here? They had a little tent, and I heard some music coming. He said, oh, come on in. So I went in their little tent, and they were all reading or writing poetry and, and writing music for healing for their PTSD. And I really never thought that that was a problem for me. But I really liked their stuff, <laughs> and it was... It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. I, I went to dinner with them, and we had a good time for two days. But I remembered, I remembered this when I, when I got in this situation, so I decided to write a poem for every day I was there. And those are all in the book. Um, so this is the one I wrote uh, when I went back in the hotel that night. It's called Faces. Faces, check the eyes. Smiles exchanged, no words. 30 years later, no VC, the new generation, but trust is hesitant to show its face to me. So that's how I felt that night when I, when I uh, and I didn't, I didn't go out for dinner, I stayed at the hotel. So as you can see, Vietnam is still a beautiful country. Um, this is what I found in 1998. Now this was one of my last aerial shots that I did in downtown Saigon. Most of those little houses are built out of cardboard boxes and other things. Like I said before, they're very resourceful. I don't think they had any downspouts on them, but I don't know. So this is Saigon today. So there's quite a bit of difference. So when you go back to this country and you remember what it was like in 1969, and now you see it today, and you see it prospering, uh, I got treated very well by the Vietnamese people in 1998 and again in 2005. This is Play Coup in 1998. Remember the big boy hamburgers? Okay, look at the building up on the right-hand corner of this street. That open sewer that you saw was right there in that first picture with the dirt road. Completely different. And a buddy of mine went back to play coup last year. And that's what he saw in that same location. So right now, that little dirt road with the open sewer is right around there. And that big boy hamburger shop is on the other side of that tree. I always tell my, my veteran friends, or especially new veterans I meet, who say, you know, I'm just having trouble getting through it, still to this day. And I said, well, what you have to really think about is the war that you remember is just that. It's, it's something that's going on in your head, but it's not going on there anymore. Uh, it's different. And I know that's a very, very hard thing to get through. Enter your hill, 1998, that's what it looked like. Nothing. Everything was repurposed, torn down and repurposed. The people who worked for us, the people you saw fleeing down that street in 1975, all went to prison for seven years. They called it a reunification camp where they could learn to be good citizens again and forget that we were ever there. The bunker you saw earlier, I'm standing right where it was. And there's the mountain in, in the background that you saw in the other shots. Went back in 2005, that same spot. They're building a big road through there. And off to the left was a... Um, big factory complex. The orphanage, 
That's the church today. Those are the people who live around the community. They're not orphans. They added a little front porch on this church since I was there last. Oops, sorry. Those are the kids that live in the community now. In fact, they were going to school right next door to there, and they all came out to see what an American looked like. And of course, they're very small people, so they had to hold their hands up to mine and their feet next to mine, and they got a lot of laughs out of that. But uh, you can see the, uh, the door. There's the door, same door, no different. There's the door over there. I was a little off, but I did it by memory, so it's not too bad. And of course, you know, that reminds you what the kids looked like back then. And Highway 19, I wanted to ride down Highway 19 one time without getting shot at. I wrote a poem about that too. I don't know if they're gonna make me stop talking anytime soon, but I can go on for a little while. Um, but uh, the orphanage, this is what I wrote about the orphanage. Um, a strange word, orphan. Memories of dirty faces, torn clothing, empty eyes, and empty stomachs form its definition for me. American guests by day and Viet Cong visitors by night, how confusing. Buildings constructed of hand-me-downs, gutters and downspouts formed from Canada Dry pop cans discarded by thoughtless GIs one man's trash, an orphan's treasure. American guests by day and Viet Cong visitors by night, how confusing. A gym set made from sticks, games drawn in the dirt, artwork on the wrist, lines of blue ink forever etched in my memory. American guests by day and Viet Cong visitors by night, how confusing. 30 years later, one American visitor no Viet Cong, no orphans, no garden, no nuns, and no orphanage. How confusing. And I did take that trip down Highway 19, back to the Mangyang Pass. You don't see any large trees growing there, do you? It's all shrubs and there's things growing. But, um, And now, they're making a little money from the road. Uh, and so when I wrote about that, I said, no mine sweeps to wait for, no ambushes to expect. The air was quiet except for the horns of vehicles demanding their space. Put the pedal to the metal, memories of fear and death fading with each passing mile. Rice and coffee, corn and more rice, children going to school, electric wires overhead, the dreaded ribbon of asphalt, QL19, was dragging me into the present. So this is Hanoi. Everyone was working in Hanoi when I was there in 98. Same as, same as before, except now they're dressed a little nicer. Um, the shoes there shining are a little bit different. But everything's done on the street. Young lady there is um, selling uh, sugar cane. And this, of course, is, this, is the uh, famous Hanoi Hilton prison. And this particular room was where they brought the prisoners, to, if they if they decided to put them all together for a while, and they had those um, ankle bracelets there that they chained them down to. Uh, this is one of the rooms that McCain spent a lot of time in. Um, and the cell that McCain was in was like this one. Um, the inside of that cell is a concrete pad that slopes downward with a drain at the end of it. And sometimes they were in here for days and days and days and never got out. McCain was shot down in this lake, and so the North Vietnamese uh, erected this 
monument for him in his memory. Uh, this was when they were trying to force um, McCain to uh, leave, leave the country and leave his buddies behind, and it was really all about his father being an admiral. Uh, I can get very political about these things. So in 2005, I took five other guys back with me to Vietnam. Two of those were combat veterans. And uh, you can see some of the beautiful things that are still there. Uh, this is uh, in Tay Nan. It represents a religion that was started by the Vietnamese in uh, 1922 called the Cao Dai, C-A-O-D-A-I. And the Cao Dai religion has three uh, spiritual diviners, Jesus Christ, Dr. Hugo, and Sun Yat-sen. So that's quite a, a, a group there. Um, those are the guys that went back with me. Uh, you go down to the Delta, you still see people living on boats, but you also see that bigger boat in the back uh, carries bus transportation and trucks and they've dredged the river and they've got condos being built all along that river now and uh, the tourist business is booming in, in uh, Vietnam. Has been for a long time because after we left, the Russians came in and helped rebuild the country. Uh, China came over and built hotels, Korea built hotels, Australian built hotels. We were the only ones not doing anything until uh, uh, about 1990 four or five. And this, this young couple owns one of the boats. You get over to the South China Sea, instead of seeing that barbed wire over there, you, you've got um, people swimming, fishing boats. Um, everyone gets up and goes, instead of going to work, they come down to the ocean in the morning, play, play volleyball and, and jog and swim and they have bathhouses right there. So they just get ready for work and they, they go right after their workout. A little different. Um, this is um, a rubber tree plantation. Those were great hiding places for the enemy in, in, back in the day. And this is interesting. Uh, this is um, over in Tainin province. And uh, this is Nui Ba Din, translated Black Virgin Mountain. And I have a good friend of mine who was one of the guys who went back with me to Vietnam. He was a point man with a dog on this mountain. So I don't know if you knew that we had canines working uh, in Vietnam, but uh, he would go out with his dog to try to search out the Viet Cong and they were trained to, to find them. Um, we had control over the top of the mountain. The VC had control over the bottom of the mountain. Uh, we lost thousands of guys here and now it's an amusement park. So, what can I say? Everything there is pretty colorful. These are some of the same scenes you saw before. And one last thought here about Vietnam uh, before I sum it up. We met with a former Viet Cong and had lunch with him. And I knew this was going to happen on this trip, but I didn't know when. So I wasn't sure how two of these guys were going to take this, so I was a little nervous. But this is sitting down at the end of the table there is, is Tam Tien. And Tam uh, was a Viet Cong who was left for dead in the field. He was wounded by shrapnel uh, from us. And uh, he had an open stomach wound. I don't show that picture, but, he, but I do have it, so I know it's true. Um, and somehow he crawled to a farmhouse. He doesn't know how long it took him, uh, but he had this open belly wound. And he found farmers that were sympathetic to the Viet Cong, took him in, got him through the tunnels. I could talk about the tunnels for another hour, uh, but the tunnels in Vietnam could hold up to 10,000 of their troops and they had a mess hall and, and they had a hospital down there and they had a well and they had escape routes and they had listening posts. Uh, they had way to, ways to get the smoke out through 
through little tubes that so we couldn't tell they were down there. Anyway, he found one of those, got to one of those, and they got him back to Hanoi. It took him two years to recover from his wound. He got married, had a couple kids, started a restaurant down in the Delta. So this is his restaurant. And when Americans come, he has them come to the restaurant and treats them to lunch. Um, but first he has tea. And during this tea, he explains his situation. And mainly what he said to us was that we were just young men following the orders of our government. And he holds no animosity toward us. Uh, he forgives us and uh, have a nice lunch. That's pretty much the way he ended it. Uh, so, so we did. <laughs> um, but you can see what happened as a result, you know, after this, um, we all had to get our pictures taken together. Um, so when I always say that when, the, when we see this scene as veterans, we know what this is. We know what happened there. But when you see a scene like this, this was the view from my hotel room on the South China Sea. Or when you see scenes like this, you can't help but to know that the war is, is behind you. Um, the, um, the la the la one of the last chapters in the book uh, is about Tam Tien, but I talk about saying goodbye to Vietnam, and uh, I talk about the trip in 98, and in 99. But I say that the goodbye was different from all others related to Vietnam. Saying goodbye to my family in April 69 was sad with hope, hope that I would see them again. Saying goodbye to Vietnam in January 1970 was joyful with hope that I would never ever return. This goodbye was filled with thousands of images flashing through my mind as I reviewed my Vietnam experience from every angle. I found myself comparing scenes from 1969 to 1998, confirming one more time that the war was over. I saw the sad faces of the orphans next to the smiling faces of the village children that I had just visited. The red dirt roads downtown Pleiku had magically become four-lane paved streets. High-rise hotels had sprouted up like zinnias in, in the monsoon. Piles of sand, uh, sandbags and miles of barbed wire had surrounded to nature, had surrendered to nature. The only thing illuminating the sky at night was the moon. No more flares. Saigon had been renamed Ho Chi Minh City, but everyone knew it was still Saigon, and most still called it that. The character of the city, the Pearl of the Orient, refused to change, no matter what name the government gave it. This time, I was saying goodbye to a country and not a war. So I want to thank you. Are there any questions you have for me? I'd be happy to answer them. I had a question. Um, yes. We saw Jane Fonda come back um, this week. How did you guys, how did everybody feel about her? I, I was so young back then, then. How did everybody feel about all the people over in the States opposing the war? Well, we were very confused by it because, you know, we didn't get a lot of, a lot of fresh news. You know, we had Armed Forces Radio Network, Armed Forces TV Network. We got to see some stories about it. But, of course, people wrote us about it. So we knew, we knew what was happening, uh, and the, the feeling was it was an emptiness, you know, and it, it caused most of us to say, we're, we're not fighting for this country. You know, we're really fighting for ourselves. Let's get ourselves and our buddies out of here alive as best we can. 
And of course we thought Jane Fonda was a traitor, we still do. Um, I could go on and on about all the stuff that's <laughs> out there about Jane Fonda, it would take all night. Um, but I think the general attitude of everyone who served, yeah, we, we served for our country. I mean, that's, that's, what we, that's what we raised our right hand to do. But we, we really thought that it was gonna be something like a very short deal and you know, not 10 years and 58,200 and some of our best guys getting, getting killed. So, you know, it, it was tough on us. Questions for our speaker. Who's got one right here? Uh, Carrie, uh, mm -hmm. I was there in 1970. Uh, fast forward, you know, 2019. We have a niece. We have a niece who is there now with her husband, uh, Homeland Security, uh, with the Facebook and all the technology. She's sending home through Facebook photographs of her crawling around through the tunnels and <laughs> acting like it's a, it's a big time resort. And, yeah. I'm a little incensed by those photographs and her attitude about where she is and all the lives were lost there. Uh, you know, I don't know if, if capitalism has taken over or with all the hotels, if it's good or bad, but I'm a little incensed by it. Yeah, yeah, I am, I am too. And I, I did go to the tunnels. Um, it, was tough, it was tough for me because it was a tourist attraction. And the tunnels in Coochie were built, or our, our base was built on top of those tunnels. We didn't even know they were there. And so I've talked to some of the people who served in the, in the ORs at night, and they swear they could hear them talking there underneath the, you know, coming, coming out of the ground. But when I went back in 2005 and took the other guys with me, I coached them about the Coochie because that was one of the places, there's three places they want to take you and you don't have a choice. Now I had a choice of all the places I wanted to go to, but there's three places they take you and you don't have a choice. One of them is the Tunnels of Kuchi. The other one is the palace. And in the palace, you have to watch a video that's about 40 minutes long that talks about how they won against, against, against the Americans, which is absolutely false, of course. Uh, so, and, and the other one, um, the other one is um, uh, the prison, the uh, prison in Hanoi. Well, there's there's a fourth one, and that's Ho Chi Minh's house. But so, and anyway, um, when I went to the tunnels, I coached the other guys not to go. I said we we're going to take the bus, but I said I've already seen the tour, and you really don't want to see it. So two of the guys sat on a bench outside, and the rest of them went. And of course, I did go with them. For, the, for part of the tour, because I wanted, what I wanted to see was how it had changed from 98 to 05, because that, that was important to me to know that if I was gonna write a book about it. Ken, we have a question online. Okay. We have an online viewer that is wondering, <clears throat> with respect to health issues that might have resulted from serving, do you have any experience or comments about how well the VA system has handled healthcare? Thank you. Yeah, that, that's, that's a mixed bag, of course. It depends on which VA you're gonna go to. Um, I would say that it has improved greatly. Um, the Vietnam Veterans of America uh, has done great work in getting all kinds of benefits passed. Congress, we're, we're the only veterans organization that sued Congress many times to get what we want for our guys and for the guys coming up after us. I think the VA is doing a very good job, especially in Cincinnati. You're always gonna hear complaints. You're always gonna hear things that are happening, but the benefits are coming through faster now than ever. Uh, in the last two or three years, uh, there's been a change at the top a couple of times. And uh, uh, we've got, I think there's 13 different kinds of cancers. Uh, they're working on, um, High blood pressure now is being one of the, the uh, offshoots of Agent Orange. We don't know how that's going to go. Uh, we just got the Blue Water Navy bill passed, and all the people who served offshore within that 11-mile radius who, who have cancers because of Agent Orange are now going to get, start getting their benefits in January. So, 
you know, I'm very positive on the VA. Uh, I'm also uh, mistrusting of our government. Okay, so those two things go together. Uh, but, but I'm very positive on the VA because of things I see being done. Um, and the VA is really reaching out a lot better now than they were 10 years ago, even five years ago. Question right here. I'm Rick. I wanted to ask you, but you, you talked about the, uh, the Agent Orange, and uh, I just want to ask, could you talk, did you experience any other toxins over there, like the napalm or any other toxins that you were exposed to or others? No, I never experienced anything with napalm. Uh, I know some people who did. I mean, napalm was a very, very awful thing. I mean, it's just one of those weapons that you better think three or four times before you use it and three or four times before you get involved in it yourself, you know. Um, but I don't know that much about napalm. I was never around it. Let's thank our guest for coming in tonight and sharing his story with us. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate you coming in. Thank, thank you very much. I have plenty of books back there, too. If there are plenty of books one. for anybody that, that's interested. I bought, my, bought one for my brother-in-law in the Navy back then. Hey, listen, um, I forgot to thank the team tonight. Um, appreciative for what they do. We've got our producer, Jay, in the back. Would you guys give him a round of applause? Uh, we've got Betty Overstreet, our executive director, and Bill Roll, our treasurer. Uh, I hope you all have a great night. Thanks for coming. We hope to see you Tuesday and Thursday next week. Thank you all.